to our political panel and joining me to discuss the day is Green Senator Larissa Waters and Liberal MP Peter Handy. Welcome to you both. G'day. Hi, Linda. Uh, Larissa, I, f I can start with you. Uh, Mark Butler says Labor will uh, work with the Greens in the Senate on carbon pricing. Have you had any discussions with the Labor Party? Do you know if there are talks going on on the attitude towards the government's carbon tax repeal? Look, I've not had any talks with um, Mr Butler myself, but what I'm concerned about is this plan to somehow clear the air to support carbon pricing by repealing the carbon pricing that we already have. I think that's very confusing logic and I'm incredibly concerned at the reports we hear today that Labor might dump the carbon price entirely um, to try and get some political clear air for them. I think people around the country would be very disappointed if that's what Labor does and it would imply that they really don't stand for action on climate change which will be hugely disappointing to anyone who cares about the future of the planet and to anyone who suffered from those horrific fires that we've just had. But, but so hasn't, hasn't, Labor, a, hasn't Labor made it clear that it still wants some form of carbon pricing, it just doesn't want the fixed price that the carbon tax was anymore? Well, the system we have moves to an emissions trading scheme in 2015. If Labor is going to vote down that scheme, they are voting down the emissions trading scheme that it becomes. And they are then playing a very risky political game in the, in the chamber as to what might come next. We, know, we now know that uh, Minister Hunt has said there might not be legislation for direct action. So we might not have an opportunity in the parliament to, uh, Labor might not have an opportunity to replace the carbon price with anything. So I think that is incredibly high stakes. Um, the simplest and the most ethical thing to do and the thing that puts the interests of our grandchildren ahead of the interests of the big miners and ahead of the Labor Party's own personal interests would be to vote to keep our carbon price. Peter, there's only four weeks of Parliament scheduled for this year, only three sitting mm -hmm. weeks for the Senate. Have you allowed enough time for debate on this legislation? Well, I think that um, you mentioned the simple and ethical re result here. The simple and ethical result is that the Labor Party supports the government's mandate and passes the legislation by Christmas. That nothing simply could, could occur. Labor is at sixes and sevens on this issue, but they shouldn't be. There was an election win based on one of the key issues of the election campaign, which was the carbon tax abolition. The coalition put that. It, was, it has a distinct mandate and it should be respected by Labor. Although the coalition in the past, even in the last parliament, eventually ended up voting for legislation uh, from the government, but it, it, it talked about, tried to move its own amendments to change it into, into what it wanted. So there is, there is the possibility of a reasonably lengthy debate, isn't there? Well, on the, on the debate, we, well, <laughs> it's been, this issue has been debated for six years and, um, and I think there's been a lot of debate in the community and in Parliament over that six year period. Um, look, I think uh, the Prime Minister said the other day it would be a great Christmas present from, uh, from the Labor Party to allow the passing of this carbon tax abolition bill before Christmas and I, I agree. Uh, we might move on now to one of the other things that the ALP's National Secretary George Wright told the press club. He was talking about campaigning, about micro-targeting, which uh, his, his Liberal counterpart Brian Lochnane talked about as well. He also says there's a challenge in how to engage in a two-way conversation with voters who are voting more on issues than, than parties. Peter, do you think yeah. that's true, that, that people who used to be rusted onto parties are actually now making, or voters are now making decisions issue by issue? Well, um, uh, certainly uh, a lot of the rusted ons are now r rusted out and they're not voting tribally for either the Liberal Party or the Labor Party. And issues are bigger than ever before. I think the, the expansion of the, so the, the, the social communicate, social network and all those sorts of things, those, the blogging and all that has informed the public a lot more about the various issues, pros and cons, and a whole lot of policy issues. And I think that's great. And so for me, it's harder, in a sense, to get votes. But um, I think that if I really, really think my case is good and I put it out there, um, there's, a, there's a good chance to sway the public. And Larissa, is that something the Greens find as well? It's not the party brand necessarily, but the issues you are arguing, arguing for that helps win over voters? 
Well, I think sadly what we saw at this last election, Lyndall, was very little difference between the two big parties on the key issues. So um, it, far be it from me to, to speculate on why voters decided the way they did, but certainly they didn't see a lot of difference on issues like climate policy, on asylum policy for that matter, on a whole raft of issues. So I think that's perhaps why we saw such an inflated vote that was not for the major parties. Although uh, the Greens didn't do as well, did you, as you would have liked? Have, have you, uh, are you having a review into your own campaign? Yeah, look, we'll, we'll do the sort of um, raking over the coals that, that all parties do. And we're certainly back out there in the community talking with people about why perhaps the folk who voted for us last time didn't, didn't come again to us this last election. So we'll, we'll continue to have those discussions. But, I mean, fundamentally, people know what the Greens stand for. Um, they know that they can trust us to stand up for real action on climate change, um, not putting politics ahead of science, and that they can trust us to look after people. So. Uh, if it comes to voting for issues, then people know what they get when they vote for the Greens. And, and Peter, when, when the party directors talk about micro-targeting, what, mm. what exactly do they mean? Is it, is it really, really niche marketing to voters? Well, what, what you can do today that you couldn't do 30 or 40 years ago is you, you can ease, uh, more easily identify issues that concern particular segments of your, your electorate. Yes, that's micro-targeting. Um, so you're actually talking to them about the things they want to talk about. So. Um, that's only sensible. So you, you want to talk to your, your constituents about what they want to talk about and that's what we, we've been doing and I think we've been successfully doing and that's what we've been communicating. The Liberal Party put a range of positive policies before the election. We were able to communicate those and we got the feedback from the constituents and we did well. I think actually, I mean George Wright's speech today, he spent a lot of time saying, you know, they lost because of disunity. Well, they did lose because of disunity, but they also lost because they weren't listening to their constituents. constituents. And that, that, it's a policy issue that they need to look very long and hard about. We might move on now. In a choice between God and Paul Keating, the words of the Almighty have won. The Australian War Memorial has backed down on a decision to replace the phrase known unto God at the tomb of the unknown soldier with quotes from Paul Keating's famous speech there 20 years ago. Let's take a listen to part of the former Prime Minister's memorable eulogy. We do not know this Australian's name and we never will. We do not know his rank or his battalion. We do not know where he was born or precisely how and when he died. We do not know where in Australia he had made his home or when he left it for the battlefields of Europe. We do not know his age or his circumstances, whether he was from the city or the bush, what occupation he left to become a soldier, what religion, if he had a religion, if he was married or single. We do not know who loved him or whom he loved. If he had children, we do not know who they are. There is a compromise with Mr Keating's words replacing another phrase. The War Memorial Director, former Howard Government Minister, Brenda Nelson wouldn't comment on suggestions either Mr Abbott or the Special Minister of State intervenes, although he says he suspects Mr Abbott would be comfortable with the final decision. Peter, was it a sensible compromise that the War Memorial came up with to not only keep the phrase known unto God, but also incorporate some of Paul Keating's words. Yeah, I think, I think that uh, we've got a reasonable solution here. Um, uh, Brendan I know very well and uh, he's very sensitive to all these sorts of issues. I think it's been resolved and we'll move on to more, more, more you know, other issues that, um, that uh, I think we've got a good compromise. And Larissa, do you think it was a, a sensible compromise? Well, look, I am alarmed at suggestions that there may have been some political pressure on the War Memorial Council. I think it's important in these sorts of matters that we allow the council as the custodians of that important military history to make their own decisions about these sorts of issues. Um, but it seems to me to be a, a logical sort of conclusion to now have a little bit from each part. That was a very moving speech from Prime Minister Keating. So, um, again, I leave these matters in the hands of the War Memorial themselves. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, Mr Abbott and Mr Shorten travelled to Afghanistan. Larissa, uh, 
a 12-year-old war is coming to an end. Do you think Australian and Australian troops have left a good legacy in Afghanistan? Because Mr Abbott also, also spoke about the work that Australian troops had done there, not only working mm. with the Afghan National Army, but also with the Afghan community. Mm. Well, look, the Greens are really thrilled that our men and women are finally coming home. It's long overdue. We've been calling for their return for many years and we've lost many good people. Forty folk have lost their lives and, and their families will feel that loss forevermore. And of course, there's more than 200 people who have been seriously injured. So we do need to take the time to think um, why we were there and to make sure that our men and women are never deployed without Parliament say so in future. That's a reform that we'd very much like to see. But in terms of whether um, the presence of our folk have been a success, I think that will really rest on whether or not the new government decides to continue the aid that Australia gives to Afghanistan. If this program, there was an agreement signed about it a couple of years ago to help support civil society, schools, hospitals, particularly for women and girls. If that's going to be on the chopping block with Abbott's razor gang, um, then I think we will undermine any of the good that we've done by being there. I think it's crucial that we maintain that aid so that people on the ground, and particularly women and girls, can get the support that they need to try and resist a, a resurgent Taliban. Uh, Peter, Mr Abbott did talk about the ongoing commitment, mm -hmm. both in terms of troops and the sort of development assistance Australia will continue yeah. to give Afghanistan. Yeah. Will that help maintain the legacy of what Australia has already done? Well, I would hope so, and uh, I, I, I wish that program to, to all the best, because um, we have had good results in terms of, I think, some 26 girls' schools have been created on our watch, some 200 other schools, 200 kilometres of roads, bridges, those sorts of things, solid infrastructure that's helped that community and I hope will help the community for many decades. That's important. There will continue to be some foreign aid. Um, there will be some military assistance through training, through our special forces, for example. Um, we're not abandoning Afghanistan, neither is the United States or our allies. This was the United Nations agreed mission that we went into in 01. I think it, it's, it's, it's taken a very, very long time, but we've got to this, this solution now, and I'm happy to see that a thousand troops are coming home before Christmas. It's not, though, possible to declare any sort of victory, is it? Because the situation in Afghanistan is still very fragile. It is very it? fragile, that's indeed correct. And, um, and so there, there, there is it, this issue of international terrorism remains a key issue for Australia and our allies. And um, I think it has been correct that, that Australia should withdraw its troops. Uh, we should maintain some presence to help the Afghans. But, but, um, but I think we've now balanced this right, and I think this is the way we should go in the future. And, and Larissa, just quickly, because we're nearly out of time, right to, to remain, to keep some troops there, particularly for training? Well, it's a very tricky issue. We've said that we think our special forces troops should come home as soon as possible as well, um, with that focus on civil aid support and infrastructure support. Uh, but, you know, these matters sadly uh, aren't determined by the parliament um, as they should be. On that note, Larissa Waters and Peter Hendy, thank you both for joining us. And that is Capitol Hill for now. We will be back at the same time tomorrow. Until then, good night.